This course is head of the so-called Halakha Commission uh, of the RCA. Uh, the Rav surprised too many people um, because as opposed to the topic which was announced, which I frankly don't know exactly what was in the program, as opposed to that, he announced he was going to change his topic and discuss Rackman's position on Adam Milt. Now, it was talk at that time of setting up a date in it, that the idea was to free all Adam Milt. Uh, Rackman was on record as saying that the only way of eliminating Adam Milt was annulment of marriage. Uh, in other words, when a marriage goes bad, if you will, when um, uh, the, the individual, the, the male, is unwilling uh, to give a gift when he's a houseman husband, uh, and all else fails. Uh, what the Beitim should do, in, in Rackman's view, was annul the marriage. And he said, unless we have recourse to annulment, we will always have a renewal with us. In other words, there will always be one case here, one case there. No matter how much we try, unless we institute the issue of, of annulment, a renewal will always be with us. Um, uh, the road pointedly uh, uh, critiqued that position. Um, and uh, I, I looked at the text. His language was very sharp. He said, usually you know that I do not single out individuals for criticism. This time, I feel impelled to do so. That having recourse to annulment will, tr quote, trivialize marriage, unquote. And that we cannot do. In other words, the institution of marriage cannot be trivialized. Um, this uh, pointed criticism of Rackman in June of 75, before the end of the, the so-called election for the presidency, if you will, was in the cards, or what was on the table, uh, again, to the outside observer meant that um, uh, the opposition of the Rav would mean that a Rackman presidency was a non-starter. Surprisingly, over the next eight months, uh, Rackman's candidacy took on um, uh, his own life for a variety of reasons. Uh, number one is that the, uh, the, the search committee that was created, which had about 50 members on it, uh, voted in favor of Rackman. Um, number two, Rackman had strong support on the board of trustees. Most important, Rackman was a proven fundraiser who had been successful in the, in, in the field of fundraising for many years. If Dr. Lamb was his primary rival, he was what would be called an untested fundraiser. In other words, people simply didn't know how he would do. Um, for all these reasons, uh, Rackman's candidacy took on a life of its own far longer than I think most observers would have imagined. Uh, within the YU administration, in other words, the key deans, um, there was a committee of deans, uh, essentially, where the vote was 9 to 1 against Rackman, meaning that the people involved in the day-to-day -day administration Wanted Dr. Walt, wanted Norman Lamb. However, among, among the, those who were concerned primarily with the, uh, the welfare of the institution, uh, thought that Rackman should be the person brought in. Uh, at the very end, they actually proposed a compromise. Uh, they said they, the, the actual resolution of, of, the, uh, uh, of the top board of trustees, the top officers, was, um, uh, if you will, uh, uh, a co presidency or a diarchy. Um, uh, diarchy means two rulers. Um, five years uh, of Rackman to be followed by Lamb's presidency. Um, uh, Rackman, I understand, was willing to accept this. Uh, it was Lamb who rejected it, saying, I've waited too long. Bear in mind also, just uh, biographically there, he had waited for Leo Jung to retire for many years at the West Side Jewish Center. Essentially, was like, I don't want to go through that again. Um, had, uh, had Rackman been appointed, um, the entire history may have been may have been quite different. Um, I casually uh, asked him. Uh, we had breakfast uh, a good number of years ago in Jerusalem. I recall asking him. I said, "When when would you date the ascendancy of the right wing over the modern wing of Orthodoxy?" So without batting an eyelash, he would say, "Well, probably was the day I was diselected." <laughs> um, uh, that's uh, I don't think an unfair uh, an unfair assessment. Uh, Professor Lloyd Gardner, who is uh, very distinguished historian of American Jewry. He once saw me reading One Man's Judaism, and he said, uh, uh, this was during, uh, you know, Jimmy Carter ran for president in 1976. He had ghostwritten a 
mean, someone ghost wrote him a book called Why Not the Best? And then he claimed that was the book that got him elected. So Dr. Gardner saw me reading this, and uh, he said, oh, that's the book that got him diselected. Um, had uh, Ted Rackman been elected, yes, I, I think the history would have been very, very different. Um, what's fair to say, though, when he himself wrote about this, about five years later in Midstream Magazine, he did make a somewhat different, um, again, you could argue this was simply being charitable on his part, but he offered a, a somewhat different analysis. He said the institution required radical change. Radical change meant getting rid of the number of personnel that uh, he had worked with for many years, that he knew very, very well, but who simply no longer fit uh, the needs of the institution. And he said, looking back at it, I doubt that I would have had the, um, uh, the inner will um, to engage in such a wholesale reorganization. I think it was a very charitable comment. I showed it to the one dean that actually supported Rackman, because uh, he, wrote, he wrote this in Midstream Magazine, and that dean said, well, from the perspective of Yeshiva University's public relations, he did the right thing. If you ask me, I know the truth to be different. You know, meaning that yes, the institution would have undergone radical change, and it would have, uh, it would have evolved in a very, very different direction. That said, um, Rackman took his talents to Bar Ilan University, where uh, he essentially transformed Bar Ilan from a, uh, a one-building campus uh, to a uh, uh, Israel's largest university. Uh, he took it out of the backwater, you know, it was a kind of, almost a kind of high school, and it became a front-ranked university. And uh, he presided over it for over two decades. So in that respect, um, you can argue history works itself out. Bear in mind, however, and this is the most critical point, at bar one, the major intellectual voices came from the university faculty. At Yeshiva University, you got to contend with Rosh Yeshiva. So that the two institutions uh, preside, prevent, pre present a very different intellectual context. One did not require Rackman to engage in a battle, and he became, as I say, an iconic figure. Uh, as far back as he became president in 1976, around 1978, 79, I think, uh, I, ran, I, I was uh, spending some time in England with a, uh, a member of the Barrylon faculty, um, and he said, Rackman is fantastic. You know, he's made our life wonderful. Um, because again, it was, there was no conflict between him and the faculty. Had he been at YU, the conflict between him and the Rosh Hashiva would, would have been enormous. Last point on all this, and again, it's, it's hard to evaluate, but it's part of the historical record. As these discussions were proceeding, and it went up to the level of the Board of Trustees, a delegation of Rosh Hashiva um, did, go to the, did go to the board and say they opposed Ragnar. Um, how influential was that delegation? Again, it did not contain the Rook because it was not the Rook style you know, to engage in a, a kind of personal battle. Uh, but clearly, this kind of delegation presented itself as if they were the total wing of the institution. Um, were they influential? Perhaps they were, perhaps they weren't. Remember, the Board of Trustees finally decided for a diarchy. So that the diarchy was not catering to the Rosh Yeshiva. Most of would say was wait five years and then you'll have a different institution or a different head of it. Um, that in broad strokes, though, is the, um, uh, uh, the Rackman's overall, uh, overall development. His last uh, phase, though, and this is where we started this evening, um, his last phase comes full circle. Uh, after retiring from Bari Lund, he once again revives the Rackman Beit Din, you know, the notion of a of marriages. And that was, if you will, his, la his last public phase of setting up such a Beit Din, which engaged in the free of the number of items. Now, this leads me, though, to um, the, the sub now, given this is kind of intellectual architecture of his career, this leads me into the question of, so what really did he stand for, and what, what were his ideas? Clearly, Rackman believed in um, limiting the role of dogma and expanding the role of personal opinion. In other words, the language of, you must believe, he wanted to limit, you know, contain it. He didn't say Judaism had no dogmas. He wanted to limit them as much as possible to give the broadest possible um, a room for intellectual dissent, for intellectual opinion. Um, he felt that um, there was no necessity that the Humra view should be the normative view. Um, and this is the comment really on the history of orthodoxy here. That, uh, what the late 20th century represented was the ascendancy of the Humra, commonly derided as the Humra of the month, if you will, 
Uh, uh, the ascendancy of the home review at the expense of all liberal views. For Rackman, there was no necessity why the home review needs to prevail. One of his pet peeves, for example, was glot kosher. Now he said, first of all, many Jews can't afford it. Simply uh, uh, comes down much too hard on people uh, who, uh, for whom there's no, uh, uh, there's no reason for such, uh, such an investment. Yet, what has happened? No one here, does, no one here at this point in time, no one thinks of not eating glot kosher. You know, that's the norm in, in the Orthodox world. Um, for Rackman, this was a perfect example of how the most extreme view became the normative view. One of the most uh, controversial uh, essays in, in this volume, and probably, not probably, the one that uh, aroused the most antagonism for Rosh Yeshiva, actually was an issue that he did not invest very heavily in. Now, he was primarily a jurisprudence person. What aroused the ire of the Rosh Yeshiva was his view on biblical criticism. And it's only it's at, it's one actually two essays in the book. Um, he, uh, he develops the view, controversial to be sure. He develops the view of let's acknowledge that the Torah was written by different people at different times. Now he didn't stop at that point. What he said is that at the same time we believe that Moshe Rabbeinu, that Moses, our teacher, assembled all these sources into a unitary document. Um, Rackman's position, uh, which he articulated in 1966, uh, is a perfect example of something that will satisfy neither modern scholars nor the Rosh Yeshiva. In other words, for modern scholars, he didn't go far enough. In the Rosh Yeshiva, they committed heresy. Uh, if, if you pressed him on it, he would probably argue, I think, two things. Number one is that biblical scholarship was not his major field. What he was responding to was the widespread view in intellectual circles that denied Mosaic of authorship. So he said, yeah, most likely there were different sources. At the same time, he said, his, the orthodox side of him was to say that Moshe Rabbeinu was the, the, final, the final compiler, the one who put it all together. Again, flying in the face of modern scholarship, which would argue the Torah was written many, many hundreds of years later. Um, where he erred in this respect, but yet it's, it's dated. Uh, in writing that, he also articulated the, the, um, the expectation that archaeology would corroborate the Torah narrative. Now, why did he argue that? Um, uh, as late as about the early 1980s, the dominant view in archaeology was that the biblical narrative essentially fits in to the overall culture of the times. So that, again, a traditionalist would argue, just as archaeology has tended to prove certain aspects of scripture historically, the day will come when archaeology will corroborate the entire narrative. Those who study archaeology realize the exact opposite has happened. Uh, in other words, the uh, uh, later trend since the 1980s in archaeological research is much more skeptical about the Torah narrative. If anything, I've, I've often argued that uh, the new archaeology is actually more dangerous than post-Zionism. Uh, Post-Zionism argues that Zionism has run its course and that Israel should enter into the Middle East and rob itself of its attachment to its uh, to world Jewry and, and to you know the notion of being a specifically Jewish state. That sounds pretty dangerous itself. The new archaeology, you know, the archaeology of the 21st century, essentially argues that uh, uh, there was never a Jewish presence in Palestine. That uh, all of it is an invented narrative. You find this, for example, Shlomo Sand's book, The Invention of the Jewish People. Um, Again, it's interesting to me that um, Rackman's expectation was that archaeology would only corroborate the Torah narrative. He invited Albright, for example, to lecture at YU. Albright, William Fox Albright was considered one of the most conservative of archaeologists. But Albright today is not a name that would resonate in archaeological circles. But uh, clearly his, 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 his assumptions, it says a great deal about his, uh, his overall outlook, his assumption was basically is that tradition will find its own two feet if it engages modern culture. Uh, his problem with the right wing was its refusal to engage modern culture. Um, thirdly, um, and this again is only an out, is a further development of his view on biblical scholarship. Uh, like Berkowitz, he believed that revelation was progressive in nature. That revelation did not stop at any moment, that it continues. Um, there are no prophets, if you will, there certainly is no batko, but the revelation of the Jewish people continues. 
which means, in effect, that the human side of the covenant needs to be upheld. Uh, in other words, the Jews are the bearers of a continuous revelation. And here is where uh, he came into um, a full-blown uh, confrontation with the Rosh Yeshiva. That he would lecture along the lines of, we over-rely on the Gedolim. We sit and wait for the Gedolim to issue their sock, as opposed to um, taking responsibility for ourselves to go out, to research, to do the study, and then, when necessary, to make the, to make the changes, like, for example, the Rakhine as he said, we can't sit around waiting for the Gedolim to rule on the note. We have to take matters into our own hands. Now, beside that, what, the, what that related to was several other dimensions of it. First, he sensed that um, what was happening in the Orthodox world was a shift in authority from congregational rabbi to Talmud of scholar, to Rosh Hashim. Rapid found that to be dangerous, but he said, the, the congregational rabbi is dealing with real life human beings in real life situations, in real life contexts, um, and they, you know, they have to they have to deal with the questions that people are actually facing, knowing who the people are. They've got to look them in the eye and say, "Well, this is possible and this is not possible." The Rosh Hashiva, far removed from the day to day, um, you know, shackle is hard. They go warp and woof. Uh, of, uh, of human life are able to issue pronouncements from on high. Now, in of itself, that might be healthy. That's exactly what a university is in some respects, an ivory tower. But when a university professor doesn't legislate for an entire community, all he does is speak his own mind. When a Rosh Hashiva is busy legislating for the Jewish people, and it's so far removed from the real life human concerns, that for Rachman was an enormous problem. Um, he added to that, uh, heavily assisted by one of his colleagues, who we reading very close to, to, to the very end of his days, uh, the late Charles Liebman, who died uh, in uh, the early part of the 21st century. He was a colleague of Rackman first at Yeshiva University and later at, at Bari Lund. Uh, Liebman developed an entire theory. He's a political scientist by nature. Uh, Liebman argued that uh, if you could actually look at the decisions taken by the Gedolim, they'd been wrong on the major questions of the modern Jewish experience. What are the major questions of the modern Jewish experience? Immigration to the United States, Zionism, and the embrace of secular culture. In all three, the Rosh Yeshiva ruled one way. The Jewish people, in effect, voted with their feet. They voted for another way. The Jewish people prospered. Had they listened to the Rosh Yeshiva, things would have been much worse. So this, in effect, was the kind of historical background you know, behind Rackman's quarrel with, with, with the Russian sheep. Um, the political theory behind it is, do you believe in freedom as the freedom to choose, or is freedom that the acceptance of the, the verdict of the battle, of, of accepting the battle's the perspective and point of view? Um, for Rackman, um, the, the twin evils, if you will, of, uh, of contemporary orthodoxy were fanaticism on the one hand and um, a quest for certainty on the other hand. Now, this is where, and in this respect, Frank, he's much closer to the world. That um, uh, what he found uh, happening in the Orthodox world was, um, number one, increasing intolerance, increasing fanaticism, in extremism, um, uh, and secondly, a quest for certainty. Elimination of doubt. Uh, in writing, he basically argued that um, he encouraged the students to question, to think for themselves, to raise doubts, saying, my job is not to give you ultimate answers. My job is to help you work through whatever questions you want to raise. That, frankly, is the mirror image of much of the Rose writings. And in that respect, it's, uh, um, it's surprising, if you will, that uh, the Rose and Rackman were not on closer terms. Intellectually, they were heading in the same ballpark. Um, I think the issue became one of, uh, if you will, the Rosh Yeshiva versus what might be called the, uh, the real life situation of Jews, for example, the entire question of, of the Advenot. Um, particularly, though, he found the, uh, the world of Torah studies uh, to be a world that encouraged authenticism. Uh, I think I mentioned uh, before the language of, well, you must believe. 
Um, it's that world that he found so problematical. He said, what is Torah studies? It should be an honest encounter with Jewish text and tradition. Ask, probe, turn it over, doubt, raise questions. Um, uh, that for him is what an authentic educational experience was about. Yet, what, what did he see in the world of Torah studies? Increasing sense of dogmatism. One of his writings is, is very sharp on this, is the uh, uh, he felt that much of Torah studies was about acquisition of fact. Um, translated to plain English, what that meant is that uh, was, you know, was one of the, uh, the pet themes of, uh, uh, of the yeshiva was that of, it doesn't matter what you learn, so much that you learn. Um, or if you will, uh, a quest for how many black gemara you could cover in any particular period of time. Uh, Rackman's perspective was that this was um, uh, a very poor educational theory. Uh, it wasn't the quantity of fact that you would, that you would, that you internalize. Uh, it wasn't the amount of material you picked up. Uh, um, you know, the story to me says I used to always tell my students, don't try to memorize names and dates. You know, it's silly. It's worthless. It's worthless. It's not worth getting into. Uh, it's happened with a very prominent uh, uh, Jewish historian at Yeshiva for many years, who always insisted he had to memorize the names of every king uh, and the dates in which they ruled. Um, this, this to me was the height of absurdity because it was not education. Uh, Rackman's view was what is education? It's thinking through problems. It's thinking through issues. And that's why I said let him, let him to his dream of what Yeshiva University ought to be. Uh, he would bring the, uh, the scholarship uh, of Jewish tradition into confrontation, into engagement with the best of Western culture. That doesn't mean that you memorize the first 10 lines of Shakespeare and the first 10 parochial of the bottom of seal. Uh, what it does mean is that you're able to bring the two into confrontation, into engagement. A rare talent, to be sure, but in many ways, a very exciting and uh, very challenging educational mission. Um, lastly, in terms of his, uh, his overall thinking, uh, the relationship with conservative and reform rabbis. Remember, Berkowitz had, had focused on this as well. Berkowitz argued uh, that uh, conservative reform rabbis were toim, they were mistaken, but they were not mumarim, they were not heretical. Therefore, Berkowitz argued, conservative reform rabbis should not be prevented from officiating life cycle ceremonies in the state of Israel, particularly issues over, over marriage and divorce. Um, Rackman's position was more modest, but in many ways much more uh, challenging to the Orthodox establishment. He urged that the RCA, of which he was a very prominent member, I said, one, what distinguished Rackman from Berkowitz is that Rackman remained part of the establishment almost to his last day. He urged that the RCA refrain from attacks on the non-Orthodox rabbinate. Um, one of the reasons I, I bring this in is that uh, uh, his writing here is eerily reminiscent uh, of the current attacks upon YCT of Shiva Fogbeto. Uh, in other words, that he, urged them, he, he urged them to say, see your conservative reform colleagues as people on the same side of the street. They may be mistaken, you know, there may be areas of serious disagreement, but the kinds of attacks that Orthodox rabbis seem comfortable with really have, do not advance the collective Jewish uh, expression, collective Jewish experience. Those are in terms of his overall hashkafa, or overall outlook. What about his theory of Jewish law? And here, as I say, he was primarily, in terms of his own scholarship, he was primarily a man of jurisprudence, you know, a man of, uh, a man of halakhic scholarship. His view of halakha is that fundamentally, at root, it's functional in nature. You know, it's meant to serve a particular function or purpose, which means you don't absolutize the halakha. What you do is you see the ends which the halakha is meant to serve, and then you develop the halakha to service those ends. Very similar to Berkowitz, who argued that the uh, member halakha is only the way, is not the uh, for Berkowitz, Torah values were eternal. Torah halakha was subject to change. Rackman, in many ways, is much more conservative than Berkowitz, that he wasn't willing to engage in wholesale change in halakha. But he's at one with Berkowitz in calling for certain changes that would advance the purposes of Torah um, rather than hinder those purposes. The, pr the fundamental principle for, for Rackman is what I look at. The purpose of the halakha is to advance human life. Now, again, you could, you could 
could apply this theoretically in a, a wide number of areas. We saw about Berkowitz last week in terms of autopsies. Um, Rackman made his fundamental uh, contribution to the issue of, of Agnot, as we said earlier. But the principle was the same, namely that the halakha requires development as historical conditions change. In other words, again, codification was the problem because it froze the halakha, it froze its history. Um, halakha does require change. Um, development is that more, the more polite term, if you will. It does require development when historical conditions are different and it no longer serves the purposes of the Chaiklachem. His pet example was actually women um, and the entire question of women's equality. Now, again, I said I would note is the best expression of that, but Rackman basically takes a step back and he raises the question of how did Chalitza come into being? The origin of Chalitza, you know, this is uh, the issue of a, uh, a woman whose uh, husband has died and his brother is still alive. Under, under the law, she is supposed to marry the brother. Chalitza comes into play um, over a period of time, so that today it's, I would say, 99.9% .9 universal that Chalitza is practiced as opposed to Yiblo. So Rackman offers a historicist analysis. Namely, there was a time when all women preferred a bad marriage to no marriage at all. Therefore, whether they particularly wanted to get married to the brother of the, of, the, of the husband was ultimately a secondary question. The main point is, is that she wanted to be married. Therefore, evil was introduced to advance the position of the woman. Over time, that was clearly no longer the case. So what do the rabbis do? Instead of seeing chalitza as something that the Torah made room for, they essentially mandated it. They essentially made it universal. Rackman, that, um, that's a perfect example of halakhic development at its finest, but the process froze. It didn't go far enough. In other words, the same process should have been applied to questions like Agunot. Um, in that respect, um, when he argued that there's no resolution of Agunot without annulment of marriage, what he was saying is that we need to do what the rabbis had started doing, what they made considerable progress in. Uh, for example, I mean, the uh, uh, the whole issue of Aguna, when a, when a man disappears at war, or kind of simply disappears, and you have one witness that says he died, as opposed to two witnesses, which is our usual thing. So again, out of consideration for the woman, to keep her unchained, one witness was considered satisfactory. But obviously that's irrelevant in the case of the recalcitrant husband. Because the husband says, I'm not gonna divorce you no matter what you do, because I can't stand you at this point. When you, when you reach that point, the issue of one witness or two witnesses becomes irrelevant. So Rackman's point is that, yes, the halakha developed because rabbinic authorities were willing to make the necessary changes. But over the course of time, the halakha became frozen by the gedolim. We need to advance that process. In that context, again, though, he adopts a very middle road position between the orthodox right and the non-orthodox. Um, for the Orthodox right, he says the fundamentalists oppose any kind of development. The only development that they'll tolerate is adding on one more chumro. In other words, you can develop, but only in the direction of making it more difficult rather than less difficult. The non-Orthodox movements, um, he calls the liberal movements, um, not to say that he collapsed the two. I mean, he, was, uh, he had very strong relations, both with conservative and reform, and he fully understood the differences he said what unites conservative reform is that they see no reason why Jews cannot follow simple humanistic goals. Uh, in other words, if society says it's good to do X, there's no reason why Jews can't do that. Rackman's point is remember, the covenant is a partnership between God and man. That was the covenant is neither of all God nor is it all man. It's a partnership. The human side of it is, yes, you do raise humanistic issues, and you see if the halakha can be developed in that direction. But the God side of it is to remember the covenant originates with the divine imperative. Um, last, in terms of his, uh, his theory of jurisprudence, um, his 
that he saw Torah education as, uh, and here he was very, very indebted to Rosenzweig. Uh, Rosenzweig saw Jewish education as development of a Jewish personality. Uh, in other words, it wasn't the amount of knowledge that you had. It was your capacity to deal as a Jew with contemporary issues, contemporary problems. What Rapton is saying is that in sort of taking Torah education out of the hands of the Rosh Yeshiva and bringing it into the concept of a university that combined, that synthesized both Torah and Mada, is that our real goal is to develop a Torah personality rather than accumulation of data. Okay, uh, the last question then obviously then is um, what is his legacy, what is his significance? Uh, why for someone who spends his entire life as part of the Orthodox establishment was he marginalized from it? Clearly, uh, he lost the battle at Yeshiva University. And the battle is not simply at the issue of who will have the title of president. Uh, the battle is really about the culture of the institution. Um, uh, Norman Lamb was not by any stretch of the imagination uh, a member of the Rosh Yeshiva, so to speak. In other words, he, 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 those weren't his social his social and intellectual circles by a long shot. But he recognized a, a very different problem that Rackman did not address and he would have had to address had he become president. The problem is basically what's a simple one. It's simply called enrollments. Uh, enrollments have fallen. Uh, when I entered in 1967, uh, enrollment between the two colleges, the two undergraduate colleges, stood at 1,800. When I joined the faculty in September of 75, which was right after Belkin died, Enrollment between the two colleges had fallen to 1,200. Now, an institution cannot survive a 50% drop in enrollment. Um, Lamb, very early on, made that his priority. And the, the, the discussion among those of us in the faculty at the time was, how are we going to boost enrollment? Um, the solution that was ultimately adopted, after a considerable amount of consideration, is that Yeshiva University has a terrible name in the right wing. That's the world that is reproducing itself in greater numbers. In other words, the question became, how can you attract a much larger number of students who would be coming from more traditionalist sectors? The vision that Rackman articulated would not cut it. In other words, while Lamb himself may have been personally sympathetic to some of it, he ultimately said, let's look rightward, because that's the area where we failed to recruit students. The rejoinder, by the way, of, well, why can't you get the students who go to Columbia to come to YU? The answer is they won't come to YU under any circumstances. You know, that's, that's not their cup of tea. They want Columbia. Uh, again, this, I'm giving direct quotes. It's not speculation. Namely, that when it was looked into, uh, they said the students who go to Columbia, they want Columbia. You know, this is an Ivy League university. That's what's so attractive about it. And you remember I shared with the Dillow director those things. <laughs> yeah. so um, but, um, uh, the decision was taken much more on the basis of how can you get the people who go to Brooklyn College and paying much lower tuition, almost no tuition at all, how can you get them to come to YU? The answer is give them the best Rosh Yeshiva, the best Torah education that money can buy. Um, added to this is uh, you know, a number of other factors here. Um, uh, Lamb was also confronted with the uh, impending retirement of good many Rosh Yeshiva. Again, these were people, uh, it, was, it was an entire culture um, of individuals who essentially mocked the place. Uh, they, saw, they saw it as having no value except being a source of parnosa. Um, I was studying with one of them, the late uh, Rabbi Relic. Uh, he, he regaled us for sure, almost a daily basis of how little he thought of the place. Um, these people were set for retirement. And again, it was a whole group. Um, uh, the question is, how are they going to be replaced? Um, Lamb's vision was, these people are not taken seriously by Torah true students, if you will, because they don't take the place seriously. They may be great Tamil Chachom, they may be great scholars, but they don't take the place seriously. What we need are Rosh Yeshiva that really believed in the transmittal of Torah to a new generation of students. Let's develop some younger Rosh Yeshiva who essentially articulate that perspective. That's what was done. What that meant, though, is that we were a, 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 Talmud, a Talmud faculty that was largely irrelevant to the institution. Uh, Potok has a brilliant novel on this, by the way. Not his famous The Chosen, which is about the, uh, about the birth of Israel. 
the brilliant novel, The Promise, which is about the conflict between the Russian and themselves, between those who took Wayu seriously and those who did it. Um, uh, Lamb's view was develop Russia Shifo, take the place seriously, and really stand for those ideals, even if he personally disagrees with them. That was the position of self actually on the left end of the Rosh Hashifo. But the Talmud faculty essentially became incredibly influential. They were ascendant in terms of the culture of the institution. Thirdly, something I, I've written about a great month, which again, I, I don't think Rackman ever anticipated, is that um, the one-year program in Israel will change the face of American orthodoxy uh, in ways that no one anticipated. Uh, I'm not referring, by the way, to flipping out. Um, uh, why you published a book a number of years ago with that title, flipping out question mark, and they said, no, people don't flip out. They don't. I mean, the number of people who go from one extreme to the other is quite limited. It's rather a much more gradual shift in a more rightward, more isolationist direction. Um, so one, if you're looking at his legacy at YU, I think, again, my answer is a very negative one. He lost the battle. He fought the good fight. He had strong allies, but they lost it with him. And the institution became anything but the Rackman view. Um, it became a, a, an institution that would be centrist leading right, rather an institution that believed in synthesis. On the other hand, his other, his other legacies are quite uh, much more powerful. Um, uh, what about the, uh, the question of changes in Holocaust? Um, again, in a, in, a, in a private conversation, um, he said to me, one of, his, one of his pet examples of halakhic change had to do with the laws regarding suicide. Um, in other words, he said, basically, no Orthodox rabbi, no matter where they stand on the spectrum, is going to enforce the issue of no burial, no shiva for suicide. Why? Because in that human situation, you're not going to deprive the family, which has suffered such an incredible loss, you're not going to deprive them of the, of the rights of burial he said, this is though what he said, he used that as a paradigm, but that's the kind of humanistic halakha that we need. He said, in this case, we're, um, the, the tragedy is just so immense, the halakha authorities <coughs> rise to the occasion. The trouble is, on equally important tragedies, such as I would note, they stop short, or they shy away from it. Um, thirdly, as we mentioned, um, he transforms Bar Ilan from a backwater institution into a front rank university. Um, one which has some of the top scholars uh, in modern Israel and which contributes to scholarship all over the world. Um, and again, Bar Ilan is free of the atmospherics of a closed institution because it really is a university in the sense of housing a wide diversity of viewpoints. But fourth, and this gets into um, what I would call his ultimate, uh, his ultimate legacy, is that um, he set forth a, a view of modern orthodoxy that on the one hand was intellectually sophisticated mm -hmm. and powerful, that you would not ask the belief in things that were unbelievable. You would not ask the suspension of reason. The vision of modern orthodoxy that he set forth was one that would be intellectually compelling on the one hand, and open on the other hand, open in the sense, open to criticism, open to another point of view. That is a far cry from uh, what might be called more centrist orthodoxy, as, it, as, it's, as it's practiced today. He saw, he saw allies, and he wanted to cultivate them. He was, a, he was almost a kind of um, eminence greeds uh, among what might be called the modern orthodox rabbinate. In one of his most fascinating articles he wrote for a Dasa magazine, which was called, uh, I think it was called, uh, Orthodoxy, Retrospect, and Prospect. And he said, on the one hand, um, one prospect is that you'll see a, a growth on the right, because that's where the demographics were. He says that as early as the mid-1970s. But he said the real treasure is the growth of a coterie of the modern Orthodox rabbis who will engage modern culture seriously. And his language became almost poetic. He said, one group I can, I can live with. The other group is a joy to be in their presence. Then he offered two warnings. Again, the warnings were incredibly prescient. He said, and that was having said, it's such a joy to be in the presence of, of these modern Orthodox rabbis, he offered two warnings. One is that um, the more organized they become, the more conservative they will become, the more establishment they will become, the less willing to make the, the kinds of dynamic changes that are necessary. 
In other words, he said, you know, my heart is with them, but as long as they continue their role as dissenters, they can serve as this kind of intellectual gadfly, which in many ways how he saw himself. The more they become organized, the more they become a force, the more they're going to become co-opted by the establishment, and become much more conservative in their, uh, in their approach. His second warning was even more prescient. He said, my real fear is that they won't get their way. They'll become embittered in the process. And in becoming embittered, they'll opt out for other, other directions precisely because they're so talented. Again, an incredibly prescient observation uh, of the future of the, of the modern world. But the last, the last bit is like six bring full circle, goes back to the issue of the last note. Um, again, the Rob attacked Rackman on the grounds of a uh, annulment back in the mid-1970s. Uh, again, by the way, Berkowitz's position was almost exactly the same as we, as we discussed last week. Um, Rackman, retiring from bar set up his own bait in, uh, which functioned for a good, number, a good number of years. I saw some of the correspondence at the time from uh, centrist orthodox leaders. They said, we have to eliminate this bait in one way or another. It's causing so much damage. Um, and ultimately, Rack Rackman abandoned the bait in, or you know, he, he, he got to a point simply where he could not sustain the battle himself. My feeling is he was actually uh, pretty embittered by the fact that he had so few allies here. At one uh, ADA conference, for example, which was the supposedly the grassroots monolithic organization, his view was rejected by, the, by pretty much the, the, panels, uh, the panelists that were commenting on it. Uh, in June of 2013, four years after his passing, um, um, Lou Greenberg held uh, the Adunas Summit together with Professor Joe Weiler, interesting two, two members of RJC. Uh, at the Adunas Summit uh, at NYU in June, um, the incoming president of, uh, of YCT said publicly he wanted to revive uh, the Rackman Bay then. Um, last week at the Jofa Conference, uh, Lou announced that uh, Rabbi Sinema Krauss has agreed to set up such a bait in. Uh, um, that with its pledge, he said, I can't promise I'll solve all the problems, but we certainly expect to almost eliminate the issue about the note. So if you, um, if you look at Rackman in terms of, did he get what he, what he wanted to achieve? No, he lost his most critical battle, which was the soul of Yeshiva University. But uh, in many ways, his legacy is far greater than that, and it continues to be with us. I have a comment about the relationship between Rabbi Rackman and Rabbi Soloveitchik. Yeah. That may not be true, that may not be known, that may not be significant. Right. I have a close Israeli friend who spent some years at my mom in school and got very close to the rabbi. And he told me once that uh, he discussed with the rabbi, rabbi why the rabbi didn't accept the role of the chief rabbi of Israel after his attendance. And the rabbi told him that he believed that the halacha was so frozen that the chief rabbi of Israel should break it. But that he did not have, and he had a list of changes he thought had to be made, but he didn't have confidence that he was right in each of those matters. All right, so well, I had, and of course, he, he thought that what, what it meant was that he would have to do it himself as opposed to the Rockman approach is what the community should do it. Yeah. But that was um, I also spent a good number of years in my Monday school, 13 to be exact. <laughs> At the time I was four, so I was 17. Uh, one of the people I got to know there, Yonin and I were classmates for many years, uh, one of the people I got to know there was a Rabbi Charles Weinberg, who was deeply involved uh, in the politics of the Israeli Chief Rabbinate. He tells the story a bit differently, although it's not totally uh, inconsistent, and then I do want to comment. The way Rabbi Weinberg told the story is that uh, he had made, he had laid the groundwork, you know, politically speaking, the election of the Rob as Chief Rabbi. He tried to persuade the rope to take it. Finally, Mrs. Soloveitchik walked in and said, Rabbi Weinberg, don't you know they'll eat my husband alive? Meaning that it won't work. Now, again, is that pretty much the same as you're saying? It certainly invites, invites similarities. The only difference I would say is that um, what's happened with the rope, for better or for worse, is that um, everyone's got a ton of stories. Um, he said different things to different people at different times. Um, he essentially um, oftentimes tried to meet people where they are and tell them things that they could hear and didn't tell them things that they couldn't hear. Um, that did not lend itself to a rather consistent body of thought. And since so little was written, 
Uh, the late Rabbi Louis Bernstein, who's actually his, uh, his, son, his, son, his son lives in Riverdale, he's a member of the shul, but the late Louis Bernstein uh, basically once said, um, we are entering into an era where the question becomes, what did the Rav say, what, when did he say it, and what did he mean by it? Um, so in that respect, it's almost impossible to come to any, any kind of firm judgment. It wouldn't surprise me if that's exactly what he had told your friends. But that said, um, the, the, the written record is just so poor, that, uh, or so thin, that we really have very little to go on in that respect. But good, good observation. Sam. Uh, the question of Aguna. Yeah. I think that many of the rabbis, modern rabbis and everything, would like to change the laws of Aguna. But I think that Rabbi Reichman took a path that was sure to arouse opposition. First of all, he used the annulment as, as a basis. An annulment being something that happened before you got married. Something where you, let's say, said to, told your wife, I want to have children. Got married, but then it was not true, or that you had some disease before you got married to her. What he was saying is that if you mistreat your wife during the during the marriage, and anybody can make that claim, then that's ground for annulling the marriage. It's not really an annulment; it's just a divorce. And that, I think, perhaps I didn't. I never saw Rabbi Soloveitchik's uh, talk. I think that that is what he meant. That he's making divorce very easy. Uh, you were about 95% right to your last comment is that uh, um, it was making divorce easy. It was making it possible, but it was totally impossible. So, no, no but I, I'm cheapening that word because what, you're say, what he's saying is that the divorce that, that you're... Right, Sam, so your, your language right. is, is not about, it's not about trivializing divorce, it's about trivializing and this became the, the, the standard view of Rackman's appoint, of, of, um, opponents, that marriage is a, a sacred institution. One doesn't tamper with it. Now, but again, for Rackman, this was a perfect contrast between the ethereal view, where obviously, yes, we do believe marriage is, is a, a sacrosanct, um, and the on-the-ground view, where real personal tragedies have taken place. I had one Rosh Hashiva tell me once, there are only seven I would know to as big as but my response was immediate. I said, seven is seven too many. Um, I don't care if those, I don't, of course I don't believe for a second only seven, but even if I accepted that. Um, for those seven, um, I'd rather have some trivialization of marriage and no other note. Now, yeah. For the record, the case my father acted on, he had written about this theoretically in the 60s. And my sister-in-law brought a case to him, a man in England, who had slept with the sister-in-law, was in a British jail for raping the mother-in-law, and she couldn't get a divorce. And my father's feeling was finally, that can't be the halakha. It goes back to <coughs> what I buy him. You're dealing with the abstract, and he had a tragedy in front of him. Sorry, I should have introduced Joseph Rathman, but obviously. Not <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome. Uh, you were a lawyer in Florida? I was. Now I'm a lawyer. I think my son worked in your law firm. I just want to make sort of a professor, a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, as I think you know, I knew Reverend Rathman reasonably well. Uh, when I was a young student at Yeshiva, I was about two generations. figure, most very influential on me. That was when I first came to Yeshiva. And then as we more and more involved throughout the years, it was, I'm just trying to share the way I felt about him, admiring him, having been influenced by him. And yet already in the 60s and certainly going into the 70s, I felt that he was completely out of the running and that the notion of his becoming a president internally was felt by the students at Yeshiva as well, uh, it was just so unlikely uh, that you're, I'm not disagreeing with your position, it's just that internally, being a few years ahead and speaking to the Smithers, uh, the hotels and the cola, et cetera, et cetera, 
And I can remember one particular thing which he used to do regularly. Here I was a Hasid of his. He had influenced me in so many different ways. Yet whenever he was, and, and he presented himself in so many contexts as being an intimate of the Rav and very, very supportive of him. And whenever he would speak about him in public, he would call him Dr. Salavechi. I remember at that time already, where I had such admiration for Rabbi Rachman, I felt that that put him almost in a completely different kind of social world from, from the, the yeshiva life at that juncture. So that I'm only, I'm just saying that, you know, regardless of how you're seeing from a broader perspective, internally, even by those who were his admirers, and I was quite a young person at the time, he seemed to be very much out of step, already even at that juncture. I'll check it says two things that I want to pick up on. First of all, if you're talking about the perceptions, uh, Chuck is absolutely correct. If you ask me any time between 1970 and 1975, what are the chances for Rackman presidency? I, I would have said, I did say, slim and remote, slim and none, precisely for the reasons Chuck mentions. However, this issue of particular relationship between him and the Rav demands a bit more of unpacking. The major issue confronting the institution was the question of secular. Uh, it's a complicated issue. We had a, uh, an education officer here in New York State, very famous man known as William Bundy. He worked for the uh, Kennedy administration. Uh, he left, uh, he left when Johnson stepped down in 69, and um, ultimately became head of, of the Ford Foundation, I think it was. But interim, he was head of the State Commission on Education. And he was the architect of the, of the notion of state funds for private universities, including Michigan University so long as they are secular. Okay. She University was experiencing very deep financial problems. Um, Rathman persuaded Belkin that we have to secularize. Uh, what we do is we'll separate the yeshiva, which REITs will have its own charter, and the rest of the university would be secular. Now, um, that was what, that was the, that was his, his overall, overall plan. Um, students heard about this, and uh, they went bananas. Now, um, this, again, the culture was one of student protest generally, but you know, Michigan University students now were protesting the secularization of the university. Um, uh, some of it was very poorly done. For example, a number of non-Jewish faculty were appointed to the two religious studies divisions in order to demonstrate secularization. It was pure fiction, uh, but it was done. A uh, catalog was developed along those lines. The students came to the road. Um, and uh, they wanted him to speak out. Um, uh, the Rav said he wouldn't do it because of, not because of Rackman, so much because of his closeness to Belkin. Um, uh, the students said they would pick at the so-called Chag Hasifa, which in those days was held like once every seven years. It was hardly a, a regular occurrence. Um, so they, uh, they were going to launch this major demonstration, and the Rav said he would address it. At the dinner following the, uh, the ceremony, this is spring 1970, uh, at the dinner following the, the Chag Asmika, the Rav gave a very lengthy and eloquent address in which he said, and this again became very pointed, uh, and he looked Belkin directly you know, in the eyes, so to speak, as if he was addressing him personally. He said, I have every confidence that as long as you are, as long as you are president, the character of the institution will not change, <coughs> but the day will come when you're no longer president. Then I don't have that confidence. Now, in this context, the, the split between the Rav and, 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 and Rabbi Rackman was intense, and the students obviously were siding with the Rav. Um, uh, Norman Lamb, by the way, was on, sort of on, was at the same event. Uh, he initially um, uh, wanted to support Belkin and said the students and the Rav should not be so outspoken. But then he ultimately issued a statement saying that uh, the students were correct, which again obviously made him the kind of uh, representative of students' opinion. Um, as it happened, the students actually were somewhat misled. That they, they, le they, left the, they left the event thinking that, given that the Rav had spoken out, uh, that their position would prevail. Um, over the summer, uh, the students were no longer around. Uh, Dr. Belkin and Rabbi Rackman continued to negotiate over these issues. They withdrew the catalogs, that's true. But beyond that, the core principle of secularization was, was implemented. When the students came back in September and protested, um, uh, um, Rabbi Rackman responded by saying, over the summer, Dr. Melvin overruled the road. Um, and that was the way it ended. So in that sense, 
uh, I think the tension between the two was much greater, perhaps, than I've indicated here. I think you're absolutely correct in saying that any time during that five-year period that anyone thought of Iraq and the presidency, the immediate reaction would have been, that's a crazy idea, or it's a far-fetched idea. What's surprising is that the idea was sustained throughout the search committee process and nearly attained fruition. That, to me, was, was the most surprising thing. What would have happened had history been different? Again, that's subject to speculation. Well, essentially, Yeshiva never really had, nor does it now, a commitment to critical scholarship when it comes to Jewish history. And, and that's where Rob Belkin, uh, where Rob Rockman was, he was willing to make that leap and to say, we have to integrate, as you said beautifully. Yeah. Maybe synthesis maybe. was very much his commitment. Exactly. But why you? I mean, is that our years? And the alternative view was not synthesis, but rather two worlds that coexist. Right, which is what continues. That's what continues. Biblical scholarship has never been a subject of why you not critical scholarship. Yeah, that's a good not to not be talking about. I think Toby was yeah. next, and then just over here. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder whether you remember that Lou Greenberg's father, Sam Gnauer, daily shoot together. With right. Yes. And Rabbi Rackman's last appearance at RJC was at the funeral for Sam Gnauer. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think Toby was next. We'll come around. I'm uh, just curious where Rabbi Rackman himself was educated and gave him the courage to be so sure of his opinions that he was willing to, <laughs> that he was willing to <laughs> counter the mainstream. I mean, to the point of losing the press. Um, Justin, you want to respond to that? I asked him always. He believed in what he believed, and he stood up for it. I was disillusioned as I became an adolescent and grew up to realize that the way the world should be was there. You should have the courage of your convictions. You mentioned Robeson. He faced the court martial in the Air Force. Yeah. He lost his military clearance because of Robeson. But he said, they said, we'll give you an honorable discharge. They had said, you have charges, you bring them. And he, he won his case. Not one Orthodox colleague testified for him. Only a reform rabbi, Norman Gittleson. That was the atmosphere. I had asked my dad once how they, uh, his father felt about his going off to Columbia. My, 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 uh, my grandfather was a, a rabbi, but he, he practiced business. My bubby ran the store. Mm -hmm. so he was in the corner studying. But, you know, I said, Dad, how did Zadie feel about you going off to uh, Columbia College? He just said, he trusted me. For his own internal beliefs, it was just natural. And it's a different analogy. The only thing I know of where I saw the semblance when you study the righteous and the Holocaust, they will tell you they didn't think about it. They just did, did it because they thought it was right. I think that's my father's thought process. It was right. So it's not a question. But, it, but philosophy also, in other words, he thought that it was, was right. a moral judgment. He thought it was but right. Where did he learn But he, It sounds like he was confident enough. Well, he has to have been wrong. <laughs> it sounds like he was confident in his knowledge. Yeah. Okay, we're running out of time. What I think I'd like to do is let's take the last two questions at one time. Characteristic of an election. Characteristic is the people that 
campaign. And what is that? That's the, that's the height of immodesty. And what's important to the Kohen? Modesty, humility. So he was able to infuse into the notion of, of what a lot of people would have rejected as obsolescent, obsolete, et cetera, rationale which could be accepted as keeping people in their divorce. Three uh, concluding comments, well, well taken. Uh, first, though, this whole idea of synthesis, which really is an idea that at this point in time, frankly, is almost passe, almost completely passe. But if you can't get a hold of this book, One Man's Judaism, uh, virtually every chapter is filled with that kind of synthesizing Torah teachings with Western culture. Um, it's, if you will, very challenging. At times, it's unpersuasive for a variety of reasons. But it's one of those serious efforts at, at working through a real synthesis. Um, I used to assign it to my students so, so that uh, it's the sort of thing that wouldn't be forgotten at YU, but I'm sure today no, no one thinks of assigning it. Um, second, uh, second observation about uh, this sort of creeping Haredization. Uh, I, I will confess when I first suggested a lecture series to Rabbi Ganak, he's still here, he's still here. I, I offered two options. I said four dissenting Orthodox thinkers, or four trends in, in, in post-war American Orthodoxy. And one of them was directly Haredization. Rabbi, in his good wisdom, much to my delight, uh, responded by saying, people really need to hear about these four thinkers. So I would urge that you will come back at a future time and we'll deal with some of that. Final <laughs> <laughs> comment, uh, we, have, we have benefited enormously from uh, Joseph Rackman's presence tonight. If any of you run into the Neil Hartman and want to invite him to next Monday night, you're more than welcome. Have a good week. Thank you very much, Dr. Beam. Tomorrow, next week, that will be on the Neil Hartman. And as always, if anybody missed the, uh, the lecture, is available on our website and our YouTube channel.